Welcome to the Leadership Conversations podcast. I'm your host, Jono White. I'm the founder and principal consultant of Clarity. We are an Australian-based consultancy that works with leaders around the world, and our passion is to invest in people to become everything they're meant to be in order to fill the world with healthy organizations that people love to work for and customers line up to buy from. The goal of this podcast is to invest in you and your leadership. If you're just joining us for the first time, then feel free to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there. The most popular being our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from around the world in all different sectors give their in-depth answers on leadership, what books they love, what they found most challenging, uh, the most meaningful stories, how they how they structure their time through the day. That's free, so go and check it out. And we'd love to interview you about your leadership. I believe you have advice from your experience, your context, and your life so far that is important and can help other leaders. It's also a great way to give back. It's free to get involved, and you can do so by going to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest, or just Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form that pops up. We have a free resource for you on our website. It's called Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook. It has interviews with 10 world class leaders, and you can go to consultclarity.org. It's right at the top and get that today. Uh, we also have a daily email that we send out to over 15,000 leaders, and that email contains the highlights, our best content from our podcasts, our blog, uh, my book, uh, the books that we're loving that are out there about leadership. It's also the best way to get access to our masterclasses and workshops before anyone else. And there's also exclusive and limited uh, special options just for subscribers. And you can subscribe by going to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe. Now my gift to you is to work incredibly hard to provide the best leadership content I can to invest in you and your leadership. So if you're finding our content helpful, if you find this podcast helpful, then your gift to me uh, could be this. If you, if you do find it helpful, then write a review or rate our content and make sure you subscribe or follow. I can't emphasize enough how helpful that is. It really does help us to get the word out there so we can invest in more leaders to become everything they're meant to be. It also means a lot to me personally when people like you and people in our community share our content on social media. So if you do that, then please do look for me, Jono White, to tag me and look to tag Clarity uh, on whatever platform you're on. And our team, including me, I, I'm always looking to see when people have mentioned us so that I can engage with you. And also we look at sharing content. So if you if you write something about something we've done, there's also a good chance we'll share that with our followers. So if you could do that, that is a massive, massive help as we try to invest in as many leaders as we can around the world. Last of all, you can check out my book about how to deal with difficult people even if you hate conflict. It's called Step Up or Step Out. It's available on Amazon. You can just look up Step Up or Step Out John O'White or you can go to store.consultclarity.org forward slash book and check it out there. I have coached leader after leader after leader and in more than 50% of the sessions, this topic comes up. How do I deal with this person? I'm finding it really difficult and, and I just want to find a way that doesn't blow up to do a really, just to have a difficult conversation, to lead them better. How do I do that? There's a three-step process that I outline in this book that I believe can help you. Okay, let's get into today's episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Enjoy. Welcome to another episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast. Today's guest is Jennifer Dolsky. Jennifer is the CEO and founder of Rising Team. Welcome to the podcast, Jennifer. Thanks so much for having me. I am so excited to chat with you um, and to hear some of your story. First of all, can you tell us a little bit about what you're doing at the moment? Sure. So 
I started this company, Rising Team, actually a couple years ago, right at the beginning of the pandemic, although I didn't know at the time it was the beginning of the pandemic. And to me, it feels like this is the company I've been meant to build my whole life. So I've spent my career, most of my career in tech, working at several of the big tech companies and doing two startups. And before that, I actually was a high school teacher and ran a nonprofit to help kids be the first in their families to go to university. And all through it, the through line for me has been how do I help people achieve their maximum potential? And in particular, around teams, how can you help teams succeed? And so at Rising Team, that's what we work on. Essentially, if you think about traditional leadership development or talent development, it has been, you know, you kind of have an either or option. You have either sort of flat training content videos or PDFs, or you can do things that are interactive, but tend to be expensive. You need to hire a professional facilitator or get someone from HR to help you run through something interactive. And what we've done is build software that helps leaders take their teams through engaging development sessions around key leadership themes without needing a professional facilitator. That's so good. I see such a need for that. Um, and as someone who facilitates a lot of um, a lot of team sessions, I've been I, I have seen some software before, and I've found it a bit frustrating at different times. Um, and so I'm really excited about what you have developed, because I think um, I even think of one client that I've been working with recently. And from day one, we always said that I would only be in there for a certain amount of time. Uh, and then really like for me, it's almost like often my goal is to, to help them see some transformation and then get out. But one of the challenges is how do you equip, like, how do you equip someone to really sustain some practices? I think that's a big challenge around teams. So I love, uh, what you're doing at rising team. And I think, I think, um, there's such a big need for it and it's, it's an amazing initiative. Thanks. I think, well, you know, it's interesting because we do, we work with a lot of facilitators like, like you and my longer term vision is that we platformize this so that people who are out there creating great t content like yourself can actually use the software to help beyond, as you said, beyond what you can personally facilitate to help other people scale that um, yes. after you, after you leave, yes. as you say. So. Yeah, I, I think that's just best practice. Like, um, that's uh, something that I remember someone said to me once about, you know, how your sort of goal when you're coming in to facilitate is to make yourself redundant, because you really bring in some great practices, and you really help the, the team get even healthier. And um, yeah, I think I think you're on the money. And so uh, very excited about what you're doing at the moment, but also excited about your story. That's one of the reasons I've been looking forward to, to chatting with you. Uh, so let's start with your childhood, Jennifer, you know, growing up in that season of your life, as you reflect, what are some of the moments or even themes that really shaped you into the person and the leader you are today? Yeah, it's so funny that you ask this because it is one of the questions I ask every time I interview anyone, I always say, you know, how did, tell me how you got to be the person I see on your resume, because to me, it's all about that. It's all about what experiences shaped you and helped you become who you are. For me, I feel like, you know, I was very fortunate. I grew up with what my, uh, what the change.org founder calls love privilege, you know, two parents who were happy and loved me and my sister. And, and we had a, a relatively, you know, blessed childhood. I think I learned the most, the, the moments that stand out to me are, are learning from my parents. So when I think about my dad, for instance, you know, he really taught me so much, especially about problem solving. So he would often, you know, anytime I asked a question ever growing up, I remember one time I asked a question, we were staying at a hotel and I said, I wonder how many mints they throw away every night because people don't eat them. And he said, as he always did, <laughs> well, let's think about that. And then he <laughs> proceeded to have me go through the math problem of how many rooms are in the hotel and how, you know, how booked are they every night and how many mints per room do they put on the pillow and so forth. And so, you know, learning that rigor from him, no matter what question I asked is a big part of, I think what has shaped who I am today and how I think about 
problems and, and think about the world. And then from my mother, you know, man, my mother is one tough woman. She, <laughs> she actually, when she was uh, in her late twenties, she had cancer and she had surgery um, for the cancer and was luckily lucky to live through it. Um, but in the process of that surgery, they cut one of her facial nerves by accident. And it, so half of her face has been paralyzed since she was in her late twenties. And, you know, you think about a woman trying to build a career who's four foot 11 with half her face paralyzed as a woman in the seventies, not easy. And she went to business school at night and changed careers when I was a little girl and I saw her doing that. She did 50 interviews before she got a job offer out of business school. Wow. And <laughs> then once she got that job, she ended up becoming one of the most successful consultants, um, you know, a partner at one of the big firms in San Francisco. And But just watching that grit that she had and her determination taught me so much um, as, a, as a child. And that has stuck with me a lot. Yeah, I, I just love the connection between um, you know, for you, like you said, the, the role models you, you had with your, with your parents and people who meet you every day now wouldn't have any idea of how, what you're doing now is so linked back to them. And that's why, that's why, like you said, I think I love asking that question because the seeds of what you're doing now and the way you do it can be seen from those role models. Are there any stories? So you told one, I love the, the, um, well, let's think about it actually, <laughs> you know, uh, let's not just wave off that really curious thought. Let's actually stop and, and do the math. Um, that's such a great story. Are there any other stories from your parents? Uh, your mom sounds like a remarkable woman. I just, you know, wow. What 50 interviews that's, um, I'm guessing you've got a fair amount of, uh, perseverance and determination from <laughs> spending so much time with, uh, with such a resilient woman. Are there any stories from your parents, other stories that just pop to your head about, um, you know, in, in their life, whether it was in um, leadership, things they did, or whether it was just in life that stand out to you and, and sort of remind you of some of the things that have become really important to you as a leader? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting that, like, the thing that comes to mind, I think a lot about my dad and his ability to build relationships and tell stories that tie people together. So I just remember so many times from my childhood, you know, watching them with their friends and, and listening to my dad tell stories about things that had happened with his friends in the past and bringing those memories back to life for everybody. And that is another thing that just really stands out from my childhood and I think has become a big part of my life. Um, you know, sort of the power of storytelling and everything, you know, I, I wrote a book a few years ago on uh, how each of us have the power to be movement starters that I, you know, I, I wrote during my time at change.org. And it was one of the things that stood out so clearly to me is that, you know, people who do have a big impact in the world often have that because they're willing to share their own stories and bring things to life for other people. And I can, I can just so clearly remember, in fact, I mean, many of those stories, right, I've heard dozens of times because he tells the same ones over and over again. Um, but that's another, another story that comes to mind. Yeah, that's so good. Um, as, as you reflect on, I guess, growing up, it's great to hear about your parents. What about leadership opportunities? For you, can you think of the first or one of the first moments where you really had the chance to, you know, quote unquote, you know, sort of lead something where you were responsible for a project or you had a group of people reporting to you or sometimes people talk about it in sport or something in teams where they really experienced leadership. Yeah. What was what was some of the first moments of leadership opportunities for you? So for me, most of where I think my leadership philosophy and experience comes from is my time as a coxswain on the crew team in high school and college. So you, you mentioned that people think about sport and that is certainly what comes to mind for me. So, you know, for anybody who isn't as familiar with coxing crew, this is the person who sits in, in the back of the boat, they steer, but mainly they coach because, you know, during practice, your coach can ride alongside you in a motorboat, but 
during a race, they can't. And so this is the person whose job it is to keep everybody together, to keep people motivated, to build trust, to strategize the race, to coach individuals in the boat. And I've actually written numerous articles about this because of all the leadership lessons I got from that that have been so relevant in the rest of my life. So I'll give just a, a couple examples. One is that, you know, this is a role where I was in the boat coaching them, but I wasn't rowing. And so the question is, how do you earn the respect of people who are working harder than they really humanly think is possible when you're not doing it with them? And I get this question a lot from people like product managers who want to earn the respect of engineers, but they're not a technical person or, you know, people who manage a function that that they personally have never studied themselves, things like that. And my take on it is just that what I learned is respect is earned. And, you know, every moment out of the boat, I, <laughs> I did every workout, I ran every sand dune, I, you know, lifted every weight I could to show that I was willing to work as hard as they did. And then I had to show them also that I had each of their best interests in mind and that, that the things I said were likelier to make us win. And so kind of earning that respect as a leader was one of the first lessons I got um, from rowing. And then another big lesson I took away out of, again, so many, but one of the others is just that the deep understanding that even though you're coaching a team, that a team is made up of a group of individuals. Because if you think about it during a race, one of the things you have to do is give people feedback in real time in front of everyone else, which is you know not necessarily the way we'd always recommend <laughs> giving feedback. Yeah. Um, but if you have to. You know, if someone's doing something wrong, at the, you know, you will lose if you don't comment on it right then. And what I learned is that some people really preferred, you know, very direct feedback. You got to be faster. You're too slow. You know, speed up. And then other people really preferred a little bit of encouragement, just a little bit faster. You're almost there, etc. And understanding those was so important because if I spoke one way, if I spoke the wrong way to the person whose preference was, you know, the opposite, it would be a disaster. And that was, you know, I would learn that by, for instance, coaching each one of them on the erg, the rowing machine outside of the boat. So I could understand what worked and what didn't so that when we were in the boat together, I knew just how to motivate each person. Yeah. What I, what I love about that as well is you were forced to give real time feedback. And um, I'm interested in your opinion <laughs> about this, but I tend, I, I'm a big believer in leadership uh, that, uh, well, I, I think this can be polarizing, but I love, I love to say to people, we, we sort of put on the pedestal, the in depth meeting sitting across from each other um, uh, that has been booked in the calendar. And we're like, you know what, don't just, don't just fly by, hit people, have a proper meeting about it, give them notice. And, and there's reasons I, I get, I guess, um, and I understand that that's good, but I'm a big believer in the hallway water cooler, small battle conversations because of a number of, of reasons. And, uh, from, from my experience, the big build up, big meeting where you don't really address little things first. And that's probably the key component of it is that, if you have addressed little things first and you end up in a big meeting, it goes well. Um, but what I'm, I, I guess it sounds like the, <laughs> you know, what you were doing in your role in that sport was giving almost like those hallway water cooler, you were forced to not just wait until after the race to give them a couple of pieces of feedback, but to say, Hey, come on, you need to change this. What's your reflection on that? And, and it's okay if you disagree, because I, I really enjoy, um, hearing different people's opinions. Did that work like that in the sport? Did it bring an advantage? And do you see that kind of like the small battles approach working in leadership? Yes, I 100% agree with timely feedback and small pieces of feedback on a frequent basis. I, I couldn't agree more that holding mm. up your feedback until you give an annual or semi-annual performance review is absolutely the worst because people need to know as close as possible to the time so that they can make changes. And, and, you know, it's because we believe in their potential that we give feedback like that. The part that was hard was the 
in front of everybody else part, right? And that's where, you know, the hallway conversation where it's immediately uh, after the meeting. Yes. Is, uh, you know, is, is definitely something I recommend. In the meeting, sometimes it makes sense, depending on what the feedback's about. If it's, you know, if it's something, for instance, that's quite inappropriate that other people need to also hear, then in the meeting may be good. But if it's something that you know, it's just a little something someone can work on, then I generally prefer an aside in yes. close to real time rather than in front of the group. I love that distinction. I think you hit the nail on the head. Um, and that is the difference that you were forced. Yes, you were forced to give real time small pieces of feedback, but you were also the negative of that situation is that you were forced to do it in front of the whole team, even if yeah. it was with a person who you know, their style would much would do much better having the having the feedback uh, privately immediately after, but you have no choice. I, I love that distinction. I think that's really that's helpful, the one benefit helpful of, actually. Yeah, I think that the one thing that it does do when you give it in real time and in front of everyone else is it does give the person the opportunity to correct in real time and then sort of do their part for the team. So if they can correct and then you're going faster and then hopefully you win, it ends up actually being a really good positive reinforcement about the feedback. So another example of that actually is, you know, now I teach a couple of classes at the business school at Stanford. And one of the things we do in my class is a lot of role plays. You know, we take these very difficult business situations and we have people role play them, you know, having to let someone go or having to have a difficult conversation. And one thing I have noticed worked really works really well in class is actually when someone tries a role play and then either I or other students give them feedback about what went well and also something else to try and let them try it a second time because then they have the opportunity to show improvement in front of everyone else, which actually is the one benefit I see from giving public feedback. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that's so true. What a great um, story of your first leadership experience. And um, yeah, I can see why you do what you do as well, because you took the way you articulated that and how it taught you so much about leadership was just fantastic. Um, so tell us more about your leadership journey from there. You, you talked about it before, the teacher to Silicon Valley, which I love because I work with a lot of educators and I also work with, you know, a lot of um, great corporate businesses. And, I, and I, I just, I love the way educators think. And so for me, I think it's, I think it's so cool that you made that transition. And it's actually very, like, I know so many uh, educators where on, on a slight tangent, I have to be careful. <laughs> like I can think of somewhere I'm like, Jono, don't, don't try to, you know, do the right thing by them and by the school. But I just see the the potential sometimes in these great educators to be thought leaders in other spaces too. And particularly if they're part of a team I'm working with, I'm like, you know, don't, don't, don't be too proactive about <laughs> sowing, sowing the seed for them to go and do something else. Um, because it's, I'm not saying at all they're wasted in education. I just, I just hear the way they do things. And I think, oh man, more people need to hear this. So that's, that's a bit of an aside. Um, but yeah, I'd love to hear a bit of a snapshot of your journey of how you went from how you became a teacher and then how you ended up in the leadership roles you've been in previously and doing what you're doing now. Yeah. Um, so how I ended up a teacher is interesting. When I was in college, I taught in the summers in a program that had started at the high school that I went to in San Francisco that was a students teaching students program. Um, basically young sort of middle school aged students who were motivated but didn't have the resources or anyone in their family who had gone to university and and they did these this summer and after school program to get on that path. And I had all the teachers were high school and college students. So I taught in that program as a college student and just caught the bug. And I was very fortunate that around the time I graduated, they were looking for people to go to different cities in the country and just model um, the program. So start our own, basically. And that's what I did. I moved to a completely new city that I had never been to before. I raised all the money to start this fledgling nonprofit, and I got it up and running. And 
I loved that job. It was so impactful and I knew we were making a difference. I would get, you know, letters from the parents. I got one I remember it said, it's a sink or swim world and you've taught my son how to swim. And it was just so, it was so meaningful. And at the same time, I had this constant nagging that it felt like it just didn't scale at the rate that I wanted. I was so eager to make mm. you know, large scale impact. And yeah. I knew I could raise twice the money and we could serve just about twice the kids. And I was looking for something that would be more exponential than that. And this was around the time of the dawning of the internet. And so I learned about the internet and I said, this is what I have to do. And I went to business school and got an internship at Yahoo. And it's very, very early days. It was about 400 people then. And sort of the rest is history. You know, I've spent, as you said, time at Yahoo and Google and Facebook and change.org and two startups. And for me, the, the thread has really been about how do I help other people achieve their maximum potential? And I think the thing that's different about my career than many there's two things. One is I've gone back and forth from large companies to startups, which is more rare. Most people sort of pick one and stay on that path. Um, and the other is, you know, I've really been driven by two things. One is impact, which I said already, and the other is learning. Like for me, I not only love teaching, but I love to learn, which means that I regularly want to take on a different challenge. So rather than start something and stay and run it for decades myself, I have found ways to pass off, hand off to other capable people that can take things after, after me. So for instance, the nonprofit that I founded out of college, I mm. ran it for four years. Then yeah. I hired a co-director. Yeah. He took it on. I helped pass it over to him. And next, this summer, no, next summer is its 30th anniversary. So, and thousands and thousands of kids have gone to college through this program now, but it didn't <laughs> wow. take me running it for 30 years to do that. And so what I've tried to do is create things and then have other people really grow them to their potential. Yeah. I, I love how you've unpacked that because from something that, um, that I hear in your story is obviously a real pioneering, um, strength, you know, we can call it lots of different things, but that's just one, one word I like for it is that you have that ability to pioneer something. And that's something that in my own life, I remember thinking, I don't know why, but I just, I just, maybe because I hadn't started three companies when I was 20 or, you know, and you're just sort of doing whatever you're doing. And, and I didn't realize I could pioneer things until I was given an opportunity where I came in and I had nine months to prepare and then pioneer um, really a new initiative in an organization. And at the time I thought, uh, okay, this will be okay. And now I look back and I go, oh, wow, I was in my element pioneering that. And I had no idea. And it took a while for the penny to drop where I even started clarity, like <laughs> my business and probably still thought, oh yeah, but I'm not really a pioneer. And then it was, it was probably only about three years ago where I went, wait a second, this isn't really normal. The fact that I just have so many new ideas and that I've been able, I was able to pioneer that initiative and, and felt very natural doing it and in my sweet spot. And now I've done that again with clarity. Maybe I'm a pioneer. Maybe that's something that I'm actually good at. What was that revelation like for you? When did you first really like, was that something you've always known about yourself or was it a bit of a journey like it was for me? Yeah, it's, it's so funny because I'm still not sure I think of myself that way. Um, I think of my sort of superpower as the ability to cultivate teams of people around an idea I'm passionate about. And that I know I'm good at, um, but it isn't always my idea. So, and I don't have any like pride of ownership over whether or not it's my idea. And so as an example, when I did this nonprofit, which is now called Breakthrough, it actually wasn't my idea. Someone else had founded it and I was modeling this idea in a new city. I still mm. had to pioneer for sure because mm. I had to go raise all the money. I had to persuade everybody you know, that it would be great. I had to recruit all the staff and hire all the people. So I was starting from scratch, 
but it was an idea that someone else had that I was taking forward. And that was okay with me. Um, I have also pioneered ideas in my life several times, um, especially at the two zero to one startup that I've done, including Rising Team. But I would say Rising Team is maybe the first time genuinely in my life that I have pioneered from scratch around an idea that is fully my own and something that yeah. I am a hundred percent passionate about. Mm. And I think the part of pioneer, like there's, there's so many parts of pioneering, you know, <laughs> the other interesting thing about the early cases, you know, no one told me I couldn't. So I just assumed I could rather than assume <laughs> I couldn't. I said, you know, like I remember when I went on this interview, so the, the program I ran, I, at a, at a private school, even though we took public school students during the summer and the head of school was interviewing me and he said, you know, do you think you can persuade my faculty that this is going to be a good idea? Cause you're going to bring all these kids in, in the summer to use their classrooms and so forth. And I said, definitely, <laughs> I can persuade them that this is a good idea. And he said, how about at my faculty meeting, which starts in five minutes? <laughs> and I just, I was not expecting that, but again, it was sort of like, well, why not? You know, I, I can, I should. And I did. Um, and so I think there's so much, you know, we are all capable of so much more than we think. And sometimes we need people to push us in that direction. And sometimes we just need to take the leap. Yeah, that's, um, <laughs> that, uh, it's funny you mentioned that as well, because I do, uh, I, and it's interesting. I don't really know where, where it came from in my life, but I, I, I have seen that myself where I have a, um, uh, what would you say, like an assumption that things, you know, might be possible or, or maybe just like you said, like I'm just, I, just because I don't think I can't do it, I sort of just jump in and, and try to do things. Uh, but interestingly for me, and I don't usually reflect that much on, on myself in conversations, but I think you have a natural ability. I can see why you're probably... Uh, in a room, a great facilitator and uh, as well, Jennifer, because you sort of bring this out in people, but I can, I can also imagine that, um, I like, I just have a, um, I've always just had a bit of a perfectionism streak and at the same time being really willing to try anything. And it's like, like to give anything a go. And those two things are so opposite. And yet they've coexisted and that's been a big <laughs> wrestle for me. What about for you? Obviously you have that jump in and, and do it. Have you ever had like um, perfectionism, that sort of thing? Or for you, I, you know, that whole done is better than perfect Silicon Valley, um, you know, minimum viable product. Does that come naturally to you? I have, <laughs> I certainly grew up more as a perfectionist and, in fact, when I think back on the people who've had the most influence over me, want, most of them were people who just pushed me beyond my absolute limits. You know, the hardest, most critical professors, the toughest coaches and bosses. And part of that is a real like desire for achievement, um, which sometimes I wish I did not have. I think the, the, the done is better than perfect has come with time. And it certainly comes from, you know, the many, you know, battles fought, hard won battles in Silicon Valley. Some, some won and some lost. Um, I've learned that lesson the hard way of going too far on something that doesn't end up working, and and how hard it is to dial back from that and so forth. So, I have yes gotten much better at how to be how to sort of dip your toe in the water, see if something's working. And, you know, we've done that certainly at Rising Team when, as I said, when I started it in kind of spring of 2020, I just bootstrapped it by myself and, you know, worked with an agency, built a prototype, got it in front of people. And some people loved what we built on the first try and a lot of people didn't. And they gave us feedback, you know, for instance, we had the initial version of the product was, was mainly for managers to use one-on-one -on -one with each team member. And we just heard so many times that people wanted something for their teams as a whole. And they also wanted something they could do 
more periodically. And so we ended up completely changing. It was a lot of the same material, but it was it changed completely in the delivery of it. And that ended up, you know, really unlocking what has been quite successful so far in Rising Team. So I've, mm. yeah, I've learned that lesson. I'm still a little bit perfectionist, um, <laughs> but I also, I think the perfectionist and the optimist in me kind of yes. balance each other out. Like I have a, a, a picture that I have up on my wall that says the glass is always full and then it shows half water, half air. So it's all just a matter of how we look at it. <laughs> I like that. The, gl- <laughs> the glass is always full, half water, half air. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot in that. So uh, let me ask you about, um, well, you know what I'd love to do because I'm just looking at the time and uh, I, I'd love to invite you back for another sort of maybe a part two down the track because one thing I was about to ask about, but I'm just looking at the time and, and I really want to give it justice. I'd love to ask about some of the mentors you've had along the way and some of the aha moments for you as a leader. Uh, but I don't think I can do it justice in the time left. So uh, the invitation's there for a part two. Great. Uh, but let's finish today by wrapping up with some Leadership Express questions. I've got a, I've got a couple of questions for you. Are you ready? Absolutely. Hit me. <laughs> okay. The first one is what's a book that you've gifted to other people? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Okay, a book. Um, sorry, I have a lot of people on my team who would criticize me for saying "hit me," which is bad language choice. But ah, uh, sure. Um, book that I've gifted the most, the, yes. Other than the, my own book, which I've gifted to a lot of people, the two most common business books I've gifted are "Gung Ho" by Ken Blanchard and Sheldon Bowles, which is an amazing book based on a Native American folktale about what animals can teach us about business. Mm. And the Rockefeller Habits by Vern Harnish, which I also love. Oh, great recommendations. Thank you. I haven't had either of those and they sound um, wonderful. And and oh, great. now you are completely allowed to have your book included in that because any author knows that, it, you know, you only would write a book if you are ridiculously passionate about it. So it kind of makes sense that that's the book you're going to give away the most because you're so passionate about it. So tell us about your book. So the book is called Purposeful, and it is about how each one of us has the power to start a movement about something that we care about. And it tells the lessons that I've learned from watching big campaign starters at change.org and entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley, both of which successfully you know, create movements that other people get inspired to follow. And the, you know, the thing that I found most incredible was that it's really any of us can do this. Like when you look at who, especially who starts change.org campaigns, it's children and grandparents and, you know, incarcerated people. It's, you know, anybody has the power to do it. And so the book talks about what it takes and what makes people successful in that path. Amazing. I think a lot of people will be checking that out. A uh, couple more questions. What is a great piece of advice you've received in life, in leadership? Someone shared some advice with you and it really stuck with you to this day. Yeah. So my favorite piece of advice comes from one of my college professors, Tom Gilovich, and he did research on regret. And it seems obvious when you say it, but when I first read this research, it was so eye opening. It basically says that in the short term, people regret what are called errors of commission, you know, things you try and they didn't work and they might be embarrassing or, or, you know, make you feel foolish. But in the long term, when people, you know, lie on their deathbeds, they really regret more deeply errors of omission, things I wish I had mm. tried and never did. And so I frame so many of my decisions in that way, which will I regret more not having tried. Yeah, that's, that's so good. That's wonderful advice. Um, what's a favorite question that you ask? Maybe it's been incorporated into, you know, the software. Maybe it's something that you, in a one-on-one interview, you already mentioned earlier, uh, a question you ask, or it's something when you're meeting with stakeholders in a casual setting, or any favorite questions that Jennifer likes to ask? Yeah, I mentioned before, my favorite question is, how did you get to be the person I see on paper or on your resume, which just unlocks so much about people's stories. Um, 
the other question, which this is a very standard question, but I do find it really opens people up to sharing deeper, more vulnerable things, which is just what keeps you up at night. I ask that of a lot of people I work with and mm. boards that I sit on. I ask the management teams and so forth. And there's sort of a freedom it allows, like yeah. rather than saying something like what's really challenging to you, which <laughs> is sort of a, you know, so it may say something about me. What keeps mm. me up at night is kind of like in my irrational, you know, dreaming <laughs> mind, because I, I feel this too. Like I may, all day I may, able, may be able to tell myself that things are fine and we're going to manage it and cups all full and all of that. And then I go to sleep and in the middle of the night I wake up about some, you know, anxiety <laughs> producing issue. So I, I usually ask people that question. Yeah, that's such a good question. And I do the same, particularly in coaching. I love to ask people what they, you know, what have you been losing sleep over? And it's funny <laughs> how often people say, well, uh, I literally, like I had someone the other day say, I literally woke up at 2 a.m. thinking about this this morning, like last night. And uh, then they jumped into something that was going on. And yeah, it is a great, uh, questions are such great framers, you know, the way they just frame and, and help. And, and it's such an innocuous difference, you know, such a subtle difference. So that's a wonderful question. Thank you for bringing that up. Are there any movies or TV shows? This can be serious or it can be really lighthearted, switch off, you know, sort of um, TV or movies that have really impacted you. So first of all, I am a complete sucker for movies and TV. My, my family and my children will tell you that I basically cry at every movie and often in TV. And I have been known to do things like, you know, clap, in a performance that's happening in a movie or wave to someone because I get so deeply into them. Um, but my favorite kind of movies and TV shows are about sports. I just love movies about teams coming from behind and people coming together. So things like Remember the Titans or McFarland USA and my favorite TV show, which I've written a whole blog post about is Ted Lasso. Yes. Yeah. I've just recently watched Ted Lasso and um, just such a, they, the way they portray his character is, and I haven't actually talked about this with anyone yet because we've only watched it really recently. Um, but in that first season, his character, I was, the thing that surprised me the most is I've seen people try to do the great team building, teamwork, um, remember the Titans, you know, for anyone who knows that movie, sort of the bringer together leader. But the thing that they did better than I've ever seen before in Ted Lasso is they made him very human and real and had his own flaws at the same time. That's what stood out for me most and how he was transparent about those and completely not perfect and had, has just such a great way to bring people together. Yeah, absolutely. It is a gold mine of leadership lessons. And yeah. as I mentioned, I have an article called Seven Ways All Leaders Should Be Like Ted, um, <laughs> because it is. It's his vulnerability and his empathy. It's sort of, I think the first point I make in that article is kindness and empathy wins a day. You know, it's, mm. it's not always about winning. It's about what we understand about helping each person grow and you know, he's nice to everybody from the critical reporter to his Uber driver. And, you know, there's just so many lessons there about leadership and about life. I agree. What a great recommendation. I'm trying to think if I've had that answer. I don't think I have. And I'm so happy that uh, you brought that up. Thank you. Last question. If you could only give one piece of leadership advice to a young leader, what would you say? Huh, so... After I wrote the book, um, which has seven chapters and a lot of different lessons, and then I gave a lot of book talks about it, I realized that you can actually coalesce the lessons in the book down to what I call the three C's. And so this is what I would tell a young leader, which is that to be successful at starting something that will be impactful, that people will get inspired behind, you need three things, courage, community, and commitment. Courage is, you know, 
basically I call it little C courage, the, the courage to just get started, to take one first step to do the thing you think you might want to do. Because once you take that first step, everything else becomes much easier after. Community is the, the notion that we just can't do anything ourselves. We have to welcome in other people to help us, support us, be along for the journey, you know, give other people autonomy and trust in the things that we're trying to build. And commitment is just the notion that it's going to be hard. You know, all the things we do that are worth doing have obstacles and challenges. And the people who are the most successful are the ones who just keep going. If we take one of my other favorite sports mentors, there's a woman named Pat Summit, who is a famous women's basketball coach in the U.S. And she used mm. to tell her team, left foot, right foot, breathe. Like that was her <laughs> message. Just keep going. Um, so courage, community. Courage, community, and commitment. Courage, community, and commitment. It was like the little bell ringing to let us know we're coming towards the end of the podcast. Uh, just part of the podcast, <laughs> yes. Jen. Apologies. We'll just roll I with it. I thought I turned everything off, but apparently. <laughs> no, that's nothing. I told you um, uh, about my four-week-old son, Roman. I don't think he's made it in the podcast. We're in a very soundproof house because I, I work from home. Um, so I've been surprised because as anyone with, with kids knows, you know, a, a newborn, uh, can be quite loud. So, uh, but yeah, so he's somewhere in the background, but hopefully people can't hear him. So now we're very real here and it's all good. Hey, for people who've just loved, uh, I guess some of the things you mentioned, they want to find and maybe follow you online on different platforms and find out about rising team. Where can people find you online, Jen? Yeah, sure. I am at Jay Dulski on all the things, LinkedIn, Twitter, and Facebook at Jay Dulski, and then risingteam.com and purposefulbook.com. Wonderful. Well, I want to thank our listeners for tuning in. Uh, such great stories, leadership lessons from Jen today. I have just thoroughly enjoyed our time together. Um, don't forget, I also have the John O. White Leadership Podcast and the Leadership Question of the Day Podcast, two other places you can go to invest in your leadership. And I think I now need to do um, some content about Ted Lasso. So if you see anything that I bring out about Ted Lasso, that comes back to Jen because I, although I've loved it, I hadn't really put two and two together about um, sharing about that. And I think Jen hit the nail on the head. It's such a great lesson. So if you see anything from John O. White about that, um, all credit goes to goes to Jen. Um, and go and check out Jen's blog about seven ways to be like Ted. But I want to finish today by uh, saying a massive thank you to you, Jen, for being so generous with your time, uh, for sharing vulnerably about your own story and just wonderful things about your parents and, and, and how that shaped you. I've just, yeah, I just loved having you on the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for having me. It's been my pleasure. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the Leadership Conversations podcast as much as I did. If you're joining us for the first time, don't forget to check out consultclarity.org. That's our website, consultclarity.org. We have so many free resources on there, including our seven questions on leadership series. We've had more than 1,500 leaders from all over the world in all different roles, in different industries, answer these seven questions on leadership and leaders give these in-depth answers around how they spend their time, uh, a book that's been significant for them. It's just a gold mine. It's completely free to access. So go to consultclarity.org and look for that. We'd also love to interview you about your leadership. I believe your experience, your life, your context means that you have advice on leadership that other leaders can learn from. Yes, you, if you're going, not me. Well, no, I really believe you would have something to add. So if you're looking for a way to give back, it's completely free to get involved. And we would love to interview you through the seven questions on leadership. You just go to consultclarity.org forward slash seven dash questions dash interest or Google consultclarity.org seven questions interest and fill out the form and get involved. We have a free resource on our website called the Leadership Survival Guide. It's a 57 page ebook, 10 world-class leaders giving their thoughts on leadership and that's completely free. It's available on our homepage, consultclarity.org right at the top. So make sure you go and get that and download it today. 
And we have a free daily email that you can subscribe to. We send this out to over 15,000 leaders from around the world. And uh, it contains the highlights of content from our podcasts, our blogs, um, our books, books we're reading. It's got the best content and it gives you exclusive, limited, early access to our masterclasses, workshops, new products, special offers. It's all for our subscribers. You can go to consultclarity.org forward slash subscribe and join 15,000 other leaders. And you know, my gift to you is to work really hard, particularly through the Leadership Conversations podcast. I have been blown away by the quality of the leaders and I'm learning as much as anyone in doing these interviews. So I, I'm having a great time. And my gift to you is to keep lining up the best leaders I can to invest in your leadership. Your gift to me, if you're finding this helpful, there is something that you could do that would help us out massively. And that is to write a review and to leave a rating for our podcast or wherever you're watching or listening to this. I can't tell you how much that helps us out. Also subscribe or follow. It really does make a difference in helping us to help more leaders become everything they're meant to be. Another thing that means a lot to me personally is when I see our community share our content. So if you do share this or any other piece of content on social media, then thank you and, and please do that. And look for me, John O'White, or Clarity and tag us in your post. Our team is always looking for posts to engage with from our community. And there's also a chance that we'll share your content uh, to go beyond and share it with our followers. Last of all, you can check out my book. It's called Step Up or Step Out, How to Deal with Difficult People Even If You Hate Conflict. I wrote this book because 50% of the coaching sessions I have with leaders, this topic comes up again and again and again. And it's this idea of how do I have this difficult conversation? How do I lead this person better when I'm finding them difficult? Or in some cases you look and you say, I think I might be leading a difficult person. They're just quite difficult to lead or I'm finding them quite difficult to lead. So there's a three-step process that I unpack in step up or step out. And the amazing thing, and I've literally done this myself and I've heard it anecdotally from other leaders as I've coached them, is that if you follow this process, you will see that person step up and change their behavior or make a decision, which is to step out some of the time. 95% uh, of the time, people will step up or step out in just four weeks. And I stand by that. It's uh, You have to read the book to understand, but uh, I really do believe in it and I've experienced it firsthand. It works. So you can go to Amazon, look up Step Up or Step Out John O. White or store.consultclarity.org forward slash book. Well, thank you so much for listening. We're going to be back with a new episode next time of the Leadership Conversations podcast. And I hope today has helped you to take another step towards becoming the leader you're meant to be. See you next time.